And welcome to Gleaming and the Geek, the Catan episode. Catan? Catan? I don't even know. <laughs> Ooh, we should, where's my Cantorino when I, you need I, I was like, I was like, is it like Prisoners of Catan? Settlers. Or, that Settlers I know. of Catan? Something. Hi, everyone. It's How about I, games John, are starting? I have John Bonus of uh, Twins Daily, and with me, Aaron Gleeman of TheAthletic.com, who's found himself in the middle of a board game uh, culture. Yeah. Deep into board game culture. Whether I like it or not. <laughs> I'm I'm the middleman now. I'm setting players up with That's free right. board games. He's a, he's a dealer. I really am. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the plug. Uh hi everyone. We uh we're recording this before the official start of spring training games. Uh it is what is today? Friday. Mon- Friday. Friday night. I almost just said Monday. Friday afternoon. They Shortly, the Twins will officially kick off their spring schedule by playing the Minnesota Golden Gophers. Correct. Um, my alma mater? If you don't graduate, are you a, yes, you still, still alma mater? Yep, yep. Okay. Um, the goal, probably, for the Gophers, don't get 10 run <laughs> I don't even know if they play nine innings or seven innings or whatever. We're about to find out together. Later. <laughs> uh, and then tomorrow, they play their first official game against the Pittsburgh Pirates. Uh, a half step up, probably in competition from the Golden Gophers. <laughs> Sorry to Derek Shelton and crew. Um, Derek Shelton is still the coach there. Well, they had a hot start last year. Okay. What? Are they going to fire their manager? Who's going to lead them to the promised oh. land? <laughs> 75 wins, if not him. I like Derek Shelton. I think he's I probably, too. I probably too. a pretty good manager, but yeah, that's, I, a, that's I just, unwinnable. I, well, that's just, that was my larger point. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so we made it. And I believe <laughs> as of right this moment, we are 33 days from opening day for the Twins in is in Kansas City. It's not bad. No, I mean, we've, that's right. we've made it through the sort of uh, ramp up to spring right. training, which in itself is a ramp up to the regular season. So right. the ramp to the ramp, we've at least gotten to. We're going to talk today about a few things. Sort of go through kind of some of the news and notes in the sense of, all right, it's been what has it been ten. Ten days, a little more than ten days since camp opened. What yeah. have what have we learned, or what do we think we've learned so far? <laughs> uh, and it doesn't necessarily yeah. have to be these big sweeping. Oh, this is going to change the season type of things. Sure. Although there's maybe a couple of those in there, but just kind of if if uh, if, if Becky were to, no, well, she doesn't care what I'm doing here. But if she were to care and she were to say, "What have you been doing? What do you learned?" Good. I'd say, "Oh, here's the stuff I've here's learned. A couple things. Yeah, I've learned that." The trivia competition at Fort Myers Brewing, <laughs> not that impressive. We yeah. rock. We kill them I, every I, week. I, I, think, uh, I think the trivia host is going to come back with a mission next Tuesday to try and stump us a little more regularly. But we, that's just going to – We had two teams score, have a perfect score. We were one of them. Yeah. And, uh, you know. Not really because of my doing. John contributed. I can uh, – and so – and the other thing <laughs> that you mentioned before we get into the stuff we've learned – right. Settlers of – see, now people are going to be mad because we're going to mispronounce it. <laughs> Catan. So, is it? I don't know. Catan. Let's say it both ways. You say Catan, I'll say Catan. That sounds we've good. covered the well, Okay. Uh, so we've noticed – this was true last year with crossword puzzles and again this year. Like in the mornings here, like the clubhouse will open right. like at 8 a.m., let's say. Right. And all the writers are just standing around waiting to – interview people are just sort of lingering which i tend to do um that's my specialty loitering is my specialty really. <laughs> right, uh, right. and then we notice us twin staffer will come by there's like a couple of card tables in the center of the clubhouse and they will just drop a big stack of printed off uh crossword puzzles and then there's like a feeding frenzy for them right and it's you know a lot of the young pitchers, it seems like. A lot of the sort of between AAA and the majors pitchers. So, like, Matt Cantorino is at the forefront. But, like, Louis Varlin and, and Chris uh, – and Josh Winder and Brent Hedrick, those right. type of guys. Yeah. My Thunder Burke might have been in there. That's a crew. So, they all grab their crosswords and then they go sit at another table and they just kind of get hunched over like podcasts. Um, <laughs> yeah. They look like podcasters. They're, const- they're in, in test-taking yep. mode. Right. And then – Cantorino, it seems like typically, is the first one to stand up and slam his paper down like he's the one who finishes first. <laughs> so we were talking about that. But then Doe, Young Park, and Betsy Helfand 
are board game nerds. They're ner- they're nerds, but specifically board game <laughs> right. nerds. Yeah. And I know they play this game, Settlers of Catan Catan. <laughs> Sorry, we're not trying to be difficult. Um, which we actually one time we were recording a podcast. I remember years ago at the New Bohemia near when I when I lived in Uptown, and people were playing that game right. at the yes. like brewery. Yeah, aspect it's a hugely of it. popular. Yes, game. and so it turns out that not only does like Matt Cantorino play it, which Matt Cantorino is like a board games and. He's just a really he's he's just, he's a nerd. Right, he's yeah, a smart nerd. Right, right. But Royce Lewis is playing it, and so we were talking to Royce Lewis yesterday, and I find myself standing in the middle of Royce Lewis, <laughs> third baseman for the Twins, incredible athlete, uh, future hundred millionaire, <laughs> and uh, Do Hyung Park, guy who does the same thing as me, <laughs> um, but slightly better. Um, and they're just talking about not only this board game, Settlers of Catan, Catan, but they're going through like strategy. And I'm in the middle, and at some point I turn to Royce Lewis, and I go, God damn, you're a big nerd, man. (laughs) And he took it well. I was joking, obviously. Sure. And then we started talking about that, and it turns out he plays in a game that they've been playing even when they were like – when it started, I think, when they were all rehabbing together in Fort Myers like last season. Right. Because you just – you have endless hours to kill when you're rehabbing. And in the conversation we had with Cantorita today, he talked a lot about it. I've been hanging around Fort Myers for two years trying to get past past this and these arm problems. You can only go – Go play right. trivia at Fort Myers Brewing so many times. Right. You could only go shop at the Publix for an hour, like I do. I just go up and down the aisles and kill time. But so it sounds leave like the bags there. Oh God! I went back and <laughs> bought the stuff I left, basically. So they really got me. They saw me coming at Publix, Florida. Um, but it sounds like you know Cantorino and Royce Lewis, and I know they mentioned Winder and Trevor Larnick and Hedrick and maybe a couple other guys have kind of uh, been regularly playing this board game, which is, yeah, like you said, hugely popular. And then I t- just jokingly tweeted about the little interaction with Royce Lewis because uh-huh. um, I just like the idea of me, tremendous <laughs> weirdo nerd, <laughs> right. saying to Royce Lewis, hey, you're a nerd. And then people started to retweet it yesterday and then the make, like the Twitter account of the board game, Settlers of, I won't botch the pronunciation again, they chimed in and went, hey, we're like actually a Minnesota company and we're big Royce Lewis fans. Can we send you guys some free stuff? And I was like, well, you could send it to like me or Doe, but it's going to be weird when we bring it in the clubhouse. So I tagged Matt Cantorino, who I would say is the ringleader of all these games. Uh-huh. And he's got the hookup now with uh, Settlers of Catan. Catan and they're going to send a bunch of stuff, some games that they these guys could play and everything. I, I'm hoping Doe can talk them into letting him sit in on a game and write about it because I feel like that would be a good – I would like to read that. And <laughs> sure, Doe is actually yes. like a good player at right. it. Um, he would understand the strategies of such. But the, the real message of this story is – the moral of this story is I walked into the clubhouse today and for the first time in four years of doing this job, a Twins player was excited to see me. <laughs> I mean that not – I'm not even kidding. Uh, Matt Cantorino was like, hey, Aaron, hey, buddy. And it was because I'm now their intermediary for free board game material. So I like this. It's a, What I said to him was, we just – Catan. It's Catan. Okay. I looked it up. All right. Chris Catan. <laughs> um, the more – look, it's monotonous for us, too, covering spring training. Because uh, it's just you're just here all day, and there sure. isn't that much to do. It's monotonous to cover a team sometimes during the regular season too. It's just a lot of time spent killing time, standing around waiting for something. Baseball season is the same way, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. That's right. And so what I said to him is, anytime we kind of catch wind of a player doing something that normal humans do, <laughs> and I know that sounds ridiculous, <laughs> but it's true. Right. Like, remember, I remember last year or the year before. Korea was talking about how he loves Marvel movies. Right, yeah, yeah. Well, of course he likes. I mean, he's a thirty-year-old guy. Like, well, that's not. But he was like, "Oh, what are your favorites? What?" Are, anytime we get a sniff of like normalcy, right. of and so the fact that they're doing crossword puzzles and they're playing Settlers of Catan, um, I don't know. It's that's I don't know. Not silly. We're doing a whole episode about, but it, <laughs> I, it's like we talked about on the Patreon actually, the last Patreon episode with about Buxton how. When it comes to injuries, it's too e- – it's you can fall into a trap, I think, if you're a fan or even if you're a media member, of just viewing him as almost like 
a robotic baseball plague entity. Right. Yeah. And so then you have no kind of human compassion for what he's going through. Right. And then the flip side is when he's in a good mood and he's happy, people are like, well, why is he so happy? Doesn't he know that he's always injured? It's like, well, that's why he's happy. He feels good. <laughs> yeah, right. He's a human being who feels good. And so anytime we can get kind of a glimpse into what these guys' actual lives are and if they're just into stuff that the majority of right. fans are into. But I did not realize until I started doing a couple of these joking tweets about this game how passionate people are about this set right. of yeah. game. Yeah, yeah. And it's like incredible. So now I've heard 50 different versions of what the game is. And yeah. I don't know. I didn't, I never thought I'd walk into a major league clubhouse and feel the urge to shove these guys in their own lockers. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like I did not expect that. I'm a huge nerd. I'm just an old man who's not into board games. But uh, so yeah, that's where we're at in twins camp. Uh, there's a lot of crosswords going on. That is a, that is a good, uh, <laughs> a good uh, uh, vision of what it's like the day before games actually begin yes. after we've been in camp for 10 days is that the number one topic is sort of, let's talk about the box of uh, potential yeah. loot we're going to get from uh, the prisoners of uh, settlers of Catan uh, guys. So Yeah. So that's, that's the buzz of twins camp. Um, today they're going to face or tonight. They're going to face the gophers. We were trying to, we being me and Doe mostly, we're trying to talk various coaches, and we even took it to Falvey at some point, into using uh, John Duran against the Gophers <laughs> because, as I said, I think it'd be funny if they crapped their pants. <laughs> right. And uh, one, more than one person, he's not pitching today, but he is not. more than yes. one person said, I think Paddock should have enough of that effect on them. <laughs> well, that's and probably like, true. Yeah, okay, Paddock's yeah. an intimidating presence right. and also can throw ninety seven, ninety eight. Yeah. Uh, so that'll that'll get the job done. I think. I, I just envisioned us going into the other clubhouse with the Gophers and being like, "How was that?" And then being like, "I don't know. I closed my eyes for it or something." <laughs> um, so anyway, that's what we'll see. We'll have uh, some reactions on probably Monday's Patreon show to the first set of game, the we first weekend of games, basically. Because they played the Red Sox on Sunday, also. Right. Uh, that's their first road game. Here's what I'll say in terms of before we get to like w some of the stuff we've learned, some of the news and notes we've learned in the first week and a half or so of of camp. We were talking to Rocco Baldelli after yesterday's workout here, after like live batting practice and all that, and we were talking about platoons and Edward Julian and all that stuff, which I'm going to write about next week, but. I asked him at some point, do you feel kind of comfortable with how this roster is currently shaping up or the, the options you have available to put together this roster for opening day and it the pieces being there to allow you to do the mixing and matching and lineup constructing that you want? Right. And what I was trying to get to was a, you know, kind of a – you end up in this job a lot of the times – Figuring out ways to ask a question without specifically asking the question. Right. And so I've asked earlier in camp about right-handed hitting corner outfielders sure. and that sort of thing, but you can't ask that every day. And so this time I thought, do you have enough kind of mix and match parts, <laughs> maybe right. specifically in the sides of the outfield, uh, to do this? And so his answer I thought was interesting, which he ultimately gave an answer that I would expect, which is, you know, we do have some really good young players that I think are able to step into opportunities if those are there and we can put together a group and all that stuff. But what he said before that was, well, you know, this isn't a roster that's necessarily set in stone or all present. Right. Yeah. And that goes back to something we've been talking about now for weeks, which is the majority of the kind of mid tier free agents that we thought the twins might be involved in it. Maybe it's even like third tier free agents, realistically. Yeah. You know, the first tier, well, the first <laughs> tier is really like the show. Hey, but that's it. <laughs> right, right. But then the real first tier still is like Bellinger and Snow and Montgomery. And then there's a group like the JD Martinez set or the Jorge Soler who right. just signed. Sure. And then I would say that the next tier is the Tommy fams, Michael A. Taylor's, um, Adam Duvall, those sort of guys. And I think that's what both of us have kind of come to assume if there is a move coming, that's what it'll be, both from a fit standpoint, but really from a monetary standpoint, which we might talk about some payroll stuff on right. that, although we did rant for the majority of the yeah, previous episodes. Yeah, we should just episode. mention the Patreon <laughs> quickly. We, yes. uh, uh, we, if you uh, are anxious for Twins News, we are doing two more podcasts every week uh, on a Patreon. 
One of the things that uh, one of the questions we were asked on the Patreon is like, hold it, are you guys really going to be doing like two two more of yes. these every week? As Monday, Wednesday, week? Friday, essentially. Uh, during I think the season. a bunch of people joined us during the play it postseason, right? Mm-hmm. And the answer is yes, we do. So it got it goes up from about you know two or three Patreons per month to about eight or nine uh, per month uh, once we yeah, get to spring training. Um, and um, and the reason we do that is because in 2019 people started asking us for more podcasts and we said we'd love to do more podcasts but we can't get more advertisers for the podcast and yes. we still can't we get we don't have enough we advertising fill to fill to, we yeah. can barely fill one <laughs> yeah. right we can't fill another uh, two or three so if, uh, if you're interested it's just a buck for each of those episodes we had one monday from spring training we had one wednesday from spring training this weekend we're probably gonna be doing a mailbag from spring training uh, then i yeah. think on wednesday we're probably going to be doing one where we cover the, like first the first set four of or games, five yeah. games of spring training. And but the we'll most recent one we did, which was right. two days ago, right. was we talked a little bit, a lot about Buxton, which if you're interested in that, I would say Buxton and Kepler, sort right. of a vibe check on both of those, which went into more kind of off-field stuff and injury stuff and all that, uh, which we may touch on a little bit today, but we spent a lot on that. And then we also talked, we sort of reacted to the prior day Joe Polet had gone on WCCO radio with Jason DeRussia and caused quite a stir, at least as far as Twitter, Twins Twitter right. goes. By being very candid. By being pretty <laughs> candid and sort of confirming a lot of the fears or suspicions that we've talked about over the last several weeks, which is very much money coming. Right. And that relates to what we're talking about with Baldelli, which is, you know, he's probably aware of that. He's not in on every discussion, but... When I say to him, do you have the pieces in place to put together the matchups you want? He might be thinking, no, but I think there's probably one more piece coming because right. that's what we think. Now, I'm not, this is not a report. Rocco right. Baldelli says this, but right. you can kind of read between the lines. And I think, you know, would an Adam Duvall or a Tommy Pham or a Michael A. Taylor turn this from, you know, a decent chance to win the division until the, to the World Series favorites? Well, no. No, of course not. There's going to be the 13th or 12th guy in the. Yeah, uh, I mean, right. this might be a. 350 at bat roll or something like that. But it at least checks what I would say is the final unchecked box in terms of like a minimum baseline of competency. And you can argue about they should have tried to, you know, they still need a playoff caliber starter, starting pitcher. Absolutely. But they do have five and with Louis Varlin, six guys who could be in the opening day rotation. They have a full rotation. Right. The bullpen, you could argue they might need this or they might need that, but they certainly have enough options to form an eight-man bullpen for opening day. And if you look up and down the lineup, there are certainly places you could try to improve, but the only spot where it's like, well, who fills that role? Right. To the point that we're talking about, like, well, maybe it's Austin, Austin Martin, Martin or right. something like that, yep. is just a right-handed hitting outfielder, whether it's center field or corner outfield. And that should be available – in the let's say four to eight million dollar range at this point, sure. I mean, God, these guys are still unsigned, and as we just mentioned, games are literally. I think some games happened yesterday. Yes. Yeah, San Diego it's, played uh, yeah. Dodgers yesterday. Right. Yeah, so yeah. teams are playing spring training games. We're essentially one month from opening day, and these guys are unsigned. So we saw Randall Grichik a couple of days ago, who was kind of on the lower or the middle uh, section of that type sure. of player, signed for two million dollars. Just right. to give you a sense of what we're talking about here. And saw so Tim Anderson side. Tim <laughs> Anderson, who's not that type of player, but right. uh five million only. I'm surprised wow, by that. Too. Um I mean he was pretty bad last year, but still I would I would that's a lottery ticket I would buy if I <laughs> right, were the floor, if I were the Miami Marlins yeah. for five million bucks. The upside there is plenty more than five million. But anyway, um it makes sense from a roster standpoint that that's the last sort of unchecked box, the most obvious. But it also makes sense from a monetary standpoint because, unfortunately, every indication we've got over the last two weeks, let's say, and certainly here in camp, just you know, talking to people and trying to get a sense for what's going on, is you know they're at 124 million right now with their payroll. That's well, you know, 30 something million below last year's opening day payroll. But there is absolutely no sense, and Joe Pole had just explicitly said as much. Right. On there, there's not 30 million coming. Right. Uh, those Jordan Montgomery ain't walking through this door, et cetera. Right. But we have gotten some sense that, you know, a five or a six million or a seven million dollar, you know, pickup to bring them to roughly 130 million, which actually, if you go back to when this TV situation first started kind of unraveling. Right. Uh, at the beginning of the off season, 
That is kind of the number we were like. Yeah, was, yeah but that was sort of the minimum of the number. We thought, <laughs> we were like yes. 130 to 135 to 140, something right. like that. And now it's so looking like we that's, struggled to hit 130. Right. I so, agree. Um, and so that's still the move we're expecting. Now, every day that goes by. Yeah. We that, expect it a little less. <laughs> yeah. Although, on the other hand, every day that goes by and there's still four or five of these guys unsigned right, that would fit right, that bill, yeah. you have to think to yourself – their leverage is just vanishing, whatever leverage they had. I mean, it, right. at some point, you just have to choose a team right. because you're going to need to be in camp. You're going to need at-bats in games. It is, you're gonna it need- is b- baffling to me that somebody who had a season like Michael A. Taylor had last year right. is still sitting out there unsigned. I like, That's crazy. I mean, even, or, or even Fam. Fam and Duvall yeah, had good right. seasons for you know what type of player they right. are, certainly. And so, yeah, that's kind of the, the one shoe to drop that we're waiting for. You know, do I think it's a hundred percent that they're gonna? John texted me last night. Yeah. So, what percent chance do you think? And I said, I have seventy five percent that they'll still sign someone. Maybe a little lower than that. But I mean, I think yeah. it just makes too much sense. And talking to people within the Twins, I'm I'm getting a sense it's you know above fifty percent. Yeah, but it's not a hundred. Yeah, but it's not a hundred, and it may not be seventy five anymore. Right. Like it does feel like it is. You know, I think what we're gonna see. I mean, we, the interesting thing about games starting now. Is we're we're going to find out how much of what has so far been behind the scenes becomes a little bit more obvious on some things, right? Like for instance, is everybody healthy? <laughs> you know, right. everybody says they're healthy right now. They're, everybody's a hundred percent to go. You know, we we have so far we haven't really. I mean, other than uh, you know, Winder's uh, scapular stress fracture putting him behind a little bit. Um, you know, in general, I'm hearing you know most people are are progressing, we're going to start to see, but if, you know, some guy doesn't appear in a game for four days. It's easier to hide that now. That's basically. right. I'm not exactly. saying hide it like uh, they're trying to really be sneaky or anything, but right. it's just, you you start to notice who's not on the roster for games right. or who's not pitching when they normally would right. pitch. You get a better sense of how quickly guys are progressing to the point where they're going to be actually be playing regularly you know, on opening day. Like There is just sort of a, a right. process here. A bunch of check marks that have to go by. And if we start seeing some guy, that box still hasn't been checked. How come that guy hasn't been in right. the game yet? Well, then we, then we can start asking about it. And it might be that as a result of that, you know, it could also be, you know, if uh, – if one of the pitchers looks like they're behind schedule or something is, you know, going on, well, then maybe they're in the market for a, a pitcher at this point. I mean, that could very well be why they're waiting too. Maybe they, maybe they have need. They potentially have needs beyond that of a right right handed hitting outfielder. But not really, though. Who? No, no, no. Right now, if everybody's healthy, yes, they it don't. Could be coming right. My point is, is that you. in a week, but they're kind of keeping their powder dry in case you know a week from now, hmm, so and so is not really. And well, I mean, we let's be honest. Were. This is a remarkably – I'm knocking on probably what isn't even wood. Who knows what this is? <laughs> uh, it's a remarkably healthy camp by twin standards in the sense that the big names are seemingly ready to go. Like you said, we'll find out if they're actually ready to go in the next couple of days. But regardless of how healthy you are in you know, this point in spring training, between now and opening day, there will be injuries. Yeah, right. There were 100 in every camp in Arizona and Florida, there will be right. injuries because they're going to play games. And if you play a month of games in the regular season, there are going to be injuries. Right. If you play a month of games in spring training, there are going to be injuries. And so then some injuries, you go, okay, that guy's not going to be in the bullpen. This guy's going to be in the bullpen. Right. Some injuries, you go, well, oh, crap. There's our number <laughs> five hitter. He's yep. gone. Now what are yes, we going to do? Right. So there are some that have a domino effect that either make you have different things you need to target or at the very least kind of push you and say, all right, we've been thinking about doing this move. Now we really have to do this right. move. And that's yeah. kind of what I, I think they might be waiting for here. But, you know, from a monetary standpoint, I promise this is not going to be another payroll rant, although we are going to talk a little bit about this in a minute. But, uh, you know, I don't want to say I've made peace with it because I think it's still something to <laughs> criticize. Sure. I think the thing, the last thing, or the the thing that the twins would want is for no one to ever talk about the payroll, uh, and that makes me want to talk about the payroll because I think it's important. <laughs> right, sure. um, but to me, it's like okay, they're at 124 million. They finished last year at like 155 or 158 million. That's a that's a lot. That's a that's one Jordan Montgomery or one Blake Snell or right. one yeah. whatever. Um, I know it's a long term deal. That's a one year thing, but you know what I mean. Uh, 
you know, I think probably a lot of people have started – the realization has set in that th- that ain't happening. Right. They're not getting 150, 155, 160. That's – it's a pipe dream. It's not happening. But then another level would be like they don't even want to get to 130 to bring in a just an Adam Duvall type. Like, and to yeah, me, if that doesn't at 122, happen, 124, right. whatever they're at. And yeah. if, if you can't even get to that, well, then it's just blindingly obvious that the payroll is affecting the roster. Like, I mean, it is obvious that the payroll is affecting the roster. If they had 100, if they had 160 million to spend this off season, the off season would have gone differently. Right. Or at the very least, right now we'd be sitting here having an actual conversation about Jordan Montgomery or whatever. Right. Yeah. So it's affecting the whether roster. or not they can really ex- take right. a, a short term deal. But right. there's there's a wide gap between it's affecting the roster that it's keeping them from really kind of making big moves to. Well, it's actually affecting the roster, and it's keeping them from just like adding bench pieces that are really obviously <laughs> right, in need. Right. And if that's the case, similar to sort of the trade deadline conversation right. we had last year. And if if it's at that level, if we're sitting here three weeks from now, and Michael A. Taylor is signed somewhere for six million, and Duvall and Fam signed where, somewhere for four or five or six right. million or whatever, and the Twins are all of a sudden going, eh, it might just be uh, Austin Martin's job to lose or Michael Heldman's job to lose or anything. Right. I'm not criticizing those players as longer term or future pieces. I think they have some value. Right. But that's that was not the plan. That is not their preference. We saw that last year. Their preference is to have a first line of defense that's veteran depth and then a second line of depth right. that's that's prospects. That would, to me, be almost pathetic if the payroll situation has affected things to the point that they can't even just fill a gap of like a you know role player gap. And so that's certainly something to watch. Beyond that, let's start to get into a few of the things we've actually learned here. The Buxton thing is probably the biggest one, right. I would say. And we talked a, a ton about Buxton on the last Patreon. So go to P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com slash Gleeman to hear that whole thing. We'll do a little... Cliff's Notes version of it here, but essentially, and again, we'll see. The proof will be in the pudding. I know I say that a lot when the games start, but for <laughs> right. now, just this year versus this time last year, year over year, it's like night and day with Buxton. Right. I mean, he showed up to camp. He was clearly not right after certain knee surgery last time, and they pretty quickly said, well, he's just going to be a DH. And even that never got him right. But, I mean, his demeanor was different. He, You could see he wasn't running around really at all. He was taking very limited batting practice because they were kind of trying to, you know, preserve his workload here. Right. Well, now, I mean, he's running around. Like, I'm almost like, buddy, should you be running around this right. much? Like, he, he just looks like his old, you know, five years he's ago. He's beating self. everybody else in sprint competitions. Yes, that, yeah, yeah. You do forget how talented this guy is. Yeah, right. And, like, how next level he is when he's – I'm sure not running at 100% and looking back like that famous uh, Usain Bolt picture where he wins and he looks behind him <laughs> as he crosses. That was him racing like Correa and others at the the first day when they were doing sprints and stuff. And so, yeah, he's he's banged a couple balls off the wall in live BP. He's shagged a few balls in, in center field, which may not seem like a big deal. but and He's only talked about trying to steal 30 bases. In the he's season. talking about trying to steal bases. And I know people hear that, and they got skepticism and cynicism, and that's all warranted. Best shape of his life. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's going to be a tough sell with him because he's been in good shape for his whole life, I think. Um, but overall, again, looking at him as a human first and a baseball player second, or at least a human first and a baseball player at the same time. He's in the, the mood, and it, it's because it's not because he's not in a good. I don't think he's in a good mood because he's like I'm going to play 150 games this year. I think he's just in a good mood because he wakes up and he doesn't immediately want to scream in pain. Right. Uh, he talked about how it felt like he had a knife in his knee all last year, all the time, and it. You can see it in his actions. You can see it in his demeanor. You can see it in you know just playing the outfield, which he hadn't done since 2022. And I suspect he's going to get into some game action, maybe the middle or late next week. That'll be the true test or the start of the true test. But just in the meantime, you know, we've had so many people and we've asked this too. Well, what's the difference? Like last year he was coming off knee surgery and everybody was very quickly kind of pessimistic and trying to make sense of the situation and trying to find a way to bring him along slowly and all that. Well, now he's also coming off a different knee surgery. He's a right. year older. He struggled last year. What's the difference? Well, the difference is this knee surgery, which was a different surgery, they removed the plica from his knee, which is a little flap that some people don't even have, as my <laughs> understanding, huh. and it can kind of affect uh, – it's not even something that is obvious – unless you're looking for it. 
uh, but they've been looking in his knee for what's <laughs> right. going on they've here been for a while. A lot, yeah. And it's, it seems clear that whatever this surgery was, he feels so much better after it right now initially than he did after the surgery two years ago. And sometimes it can be as simple as that. And look, he still has to stay healthy. He still has to check a lot of boxes and you know cross a lot of mileage before we get to opening day. Right. But there's no move the Twins are going to make that is bigger than the difference between Byron Buxton and no Byron Buxton or a healthy-ish Byron Buxton and a DH-only Byron Buxton. And so that is probably the number one thing we've learned through the first you know two weeks of spring uh, camp being here is Byron Buxton is going through normal day's routines. Right. Byron Buxton has a smile on his face. Byron Buxton is talking about stealing bases and hitting home runs and playing center field and – just again on a human level that is a sight for sore eyes like yeah. that is i mean it's it's fun to see with anybody that you you know anybody that you know to see them feeling good and feeling at their best and so on it's also just i mean it, if you're wondering why people are optimistic about buxton despite the fact that you know people have been optimistic about him for 10 years and for right. 10 years he's you know had a limited number of games he's only played in the outfield so many times etc what's different this year the answer isn't oh we can see i mean it, you know he, he's performing in a whole different way or something like that there's there's you know i've got i had concerns going into this off season about him beyond the injury concerns like it was like sure. were, were the was his performance last year solely because of the injury or was it you know, just he's 30 approaching, is he 30 years old, 30, 29, yeah. 30 years 30, old? And maybe he's falling off a little bit, or maybe the injuries are finally becoming to the point where right. they're affecting his performance. I mean, there's like a cascading really. effect. Right. Even if you come back healthy from right. an injury, it still takes a little bit out of you each time. All that can all that can still be true. So, you know, this is don't take this necessarily as a no. we are uh, we are telling you to rip up the Zips projections on Buxton and, you know, and go all in on him. Although I wouldn't mind throwing a little money on the field now for MVP vote, a- AL MVP, because <laughs> knowing that he's in there, we did look the other day. We did look to see if he's if he's uh, any of the individuals listed or if he's in the field piece. I'll give you odds. <laughs> you can take him for AL MVP. I mean, he ain't winning AL MVP, but look, I'm, I'm hesitant to even say a round number of games because remember a couple years ago, right? Uh, I won't say who, but sub media members got so obsessed about the idea of a specific number right, as if yeah, the twins right. were going to stop him from playing beyond that number. When meanwhile, it was just as simple as hey, I'm shooting for like a hundred games or whatever. <laughs> right, it's yes, like, yes, Oh, yes. if he's at 99 in June, are they not going to let him play? More? It's like, what? So, but so that's one of the things we've learned is that Byron Buxton at least feels good is going to attempt to be a full time, you know, both sides of the ball player instead of being just a DH. They're not having to kind of, you know, manage him from a workload standpoint yet. I mean, he's not going to play in every game. He's not going to play against the Gophers or anything like that. But that is the, that's going to be the biggest story of spring training, win or lose. Right. I mean, good or bad. There's going to be some outcome three weeks from now or four right. weeks from now that's going to be a story. Yes. Either it's, hey, my God, Byron Buxton actually made it through camp and he's feeling as good as he right. did a month ago yeah. and he's ready to go and he's going to be in center field yeah, on just laid out a triple on yeah. a, whatever. <laughs> right into the gap right. or it's going to be well turns out all the optimism in the world and all the feeling good in the world once the game started and he got beat up again and he's going to be on the aisle or he's going to be limited or whatever right. i mean that's going to be a story a base wrong or, right. Yeah, right um the other thing actually there's a lot of what we learned or what we think we've learned so far is going to be health based, right? Because, you know, for just the average player, you know, uh, I don't know, Ryan Jeffers. Sure. He's coming off a good season. He went into the offseason with no health problems. He shows up to camp. And as long as he's not uh, built like me and you now, there's nothing to really ask him. Like, right. nothing has changed. Right. It's like, well, yeah, do you think you can, you know, build on what you. Did last year and all that, but for a lot of guys, Chris Paddock, we mentioned our uh, our board gaming friend, sure, Matt Cantorino. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of guys like that. Well, how, how about Correa coming back off a of plantar well, fasciitis, so right, should, which is also a big one. Uh, Royce Lewis <laughs> coming yes. back. Kirilov, Miranda. Right. We can talk about all I these mean, guys. All these guys were hurt, right? And F- Di Sclafani, right? He was with another team, but he was hurt. And so I would say for the most part, you mentioned Winder is behind a little bit, although even he's not hurt. hurt. No, right. He's just hasn't. He just had a had late a full start off to the offseason. Right. Yeah. Like he's throwing, like he's fine now, 
Right. Hopefully. The one guy that I'm starting to get or or kind of feeling like it is similar to last spring. Like we've talked about with Buxton and some of these other guys, the vibe is much different than last spring. The one guy, unfortunately, that's starting to remind me of last spring is Miranda. And if you remember back to last spring, he came in and they started doing workouts and he was thrown at third base and he had a sore shoulder. Right. And they said initially, well, okay, his shoulders kind of bother him. He's not able to do all our throwing drills, but we'll just, when the game start, we'll stick him at first base DH so he can get his at bats. Right. And if you remember, he was crushing the ball. Yes. Early in spring training. Very early year. in spring training. I mean, he had yes. like five homers and it was like, well, okay, yes. he must be yes. healthy. So yeah, he's fine. It turned out to be something of a lost season for him. Because his shoulder just bugged him throughout. And he was limited defensively. He wasn't the guy we saw the previous year offensively. He got sent back to AAA and wasn't great there. Then he got shut down. He ended up having surgery and all that. So he's in camp and he's healthy in the sense that he's participating in stuff. And he's hitting. And we're going to see him. I think he's DHing today, in fact, against the Gophers, if I'm right. Um, I just quick glanced at the lineup. Yeah, I... um, but he's not playing third base and he's not throwing and that could be different than last off season in the sense that he's building up towards something as opposed to actually injured. But I kind of compare him to like Kirilov who also had shoulder surgery and Kirilov is just a full go right now. Right. And I realize they play different positions, although not really because now Miranda is pretty much viewed as first primarily baseman. a first baseman right. DH and maybe an occasional third baseman, but that's out the window now because he's not able to throw. And so that would be one to watch because, you know, theoretically, if they don't sign a Duvall or a Michael A. Taylor type, you'd want an outfielder for that role. But if they view it as, well, we just really need a right-handed bat, it could theoretically just be Miranda. But I, he might be sort of behind a little bit in that sense, too. He also just has a lot to prove. So that's something to watch on the not yeah. positive. I mean, and that might play into the right-handed hitting thing, too. Now, it doesn't it doesn't help you in the outfield spots. But, you know, they would like having a right hand, or another right-handed bench bat. We're going to see Paddock today. Um, he's a full go. Obviously, coming back last September – Means that he kind of got his feet wet again. He kind of got reestablished. Um, so it's not, oh, he's coming back from Tommy John. He's already right. completed yes. the comeback from Tommy right. John. Now it's like, okay, now we, how do we build up or what is he capable of? And I know early in camp he had mentioned 140 to 160 innings. I think that would be certainly optimistic. Like they would be very happy. They would sign, they would gladly sign up, they being the twins, right. for 140 innings of Chris Paddock this year. If you told them today, sure, not an not an inning over that, but you're going right. to get 104, they'd go absolutely. And so you know you have the quality within that. But what I wonder with him, you know, he's pitching the first game here against the Gophers. He's ready to go. You've yeah, talked to him for sure eight yeah. times about his podcast. Right? Like he's <laughs> he's raring to go. Um, we'll see if you jinxed him with all this talk. If he struggles, I'm going to blame you potentially because you guys are podcasting buds now. But yeah. so. but. I wonder, like, how, what is the best way? We saw it with Ober last year. How do you how do you kind of manage a guy around 150 innings? Right. But the difference with Ober last year is he could be sent to the minors. Right. So he began the year at AAA, and then come early August, was it? They sent him back to AAA because they were a little bit worried that he was wearing down. Now, it, it turned out he wasn't wearing down. He pitched a few times right. at AAA, he came back up, and he was quite good after right. that. But you can't do that with Paddock. You can't send Paddock to the minors, even if he wanted to be sent to the minors. And so how do you keep a guy around 140 or 150 innings and have him be a part of your five-man rotation and not be able to send him to the minors? Well, the two obvious ways you can do it are you can just have him throw three or four innings in some starts instead of five or six innings in right. some starts. And maybe that just kind of happens naturally. But I don't get the sense that they they I, want to do that. No, I don't think that's going to be the case. I mean, I I think I think this is something that they worry about at the middle of the year. Well, sure. <laughs> do you know yeah. what I mean? This is something where the, you don't address this until July. If you get to July and he's at eighty innings already, right? And right. you're like, well, maybe. Or, Although I do think they definitely are planning. They I've had a few guys have talked about this, and Baldelli has talked about this in the past. The goal here is to peak in October. Right. That's or true. Or at the very least in September. True. And so I do think that's a factor for everyone, and especially guys who there's a playing time component or a workload component. But the other thing, if you remember, this would have been four or five years ago, with Michael Pineda, who didn't have like a strict innings count, but there was a sense with him, any spots we can find to reduce his workload. 
right. is better off just for his body and his durability and all that. Yeah. And so what they ended up doing with him, because he couldn't be sent to the minors either because he was a veteran, is he took his turn in the rotation every fifth day, and he was quite good. Yeah. And he threw five plus innings most of the time. But then two times during that season, I guess yeah, it would have been tendonitis. Yeah, or back strain <laughs> or whatever it is. Something and I'm not saying it was a fake injury. Right. But it's like yeah, we'll shut him down for two starts here and right. then we'll bring him back. Right. And I, I wonder if that is kind of the plan with Paddock. Again, not to fake an injury, but to say to him, We only want you pitching at hundred percent. Yeah. If there's a point at time here where you threw ninety five pitches last night and you're not quite feeling as good as you normally would be to, in terms of bouncing back the next day or the next couple of days. Well, we don't want you just taking your normal turn in the rotation five days later. There's an opportunity here to say, all right, shut it down for two starts. Right. It's not a black mark against anybody. Take your, take a little bit extra time between starts. You know, we call up Louis Varlin or we call up David Fester or we call up fill in the blank. Sure. They make a couple of starts, which that's not such a bad thing either to get them some experience. And then maybe come September – you're strong and you're at 125 innings instead of 150 innings, or you've just made it there at close to 100%. So I'm curious to see kind of what the approach is. I do agree that they're not – I don't think we're going to see like his first start of the season, him pulled after 60 pitches because they're looking that far ahead. But I do think it is in the back of their mind of like how do we get this guy – kind of crossing the finish line in stride. Well, do you know what I mean? And I, and I think – Of the season. <laughs> I think I think in general what they will do is they will be cautious, right, with him in general. For sure. If they see something they don't like or his velocity dips or something like that, maybe they, you know, did dip into something like that. I also think, you know, just based on sort of his personality and hearing him talk a little bit on his podcast about the year – uh, he's the kind of guy that's going to uh, want to stay in games for as sure. long as he possibly can stay in games. He's going to be the kind of guy who's going to um, he's not fight. A sh- he's not a shrinking violet. No, he's going to fight a little bit to kind of uh, get as many innings as he can all the time. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I think to some extent that I wouldn't be shocked if there's some tension about protecting him from himself a little bit. Maybe, although he is pretty – I like talking to Paddock a lot. I think he's actually – Will be a good podcaster, says the <laughs> mediocre podcaster. But um, I think coming back from a second Tommy John, and like when when he came back in September last year, he really kind of opened up. I felt I, I liked that he did it to us about the whole process and right. just like starting over and saying I already did this once and being beaten down by it. But then gradually, as he rehabbed alongside Matt Cantorino in Fort Myers and kind of served as his mentor, Cantorino said to me a couple times. I skipped some stuff or I there were some pitfalls of this that I was able to bypass because Chris Paddock has already done it once and right. said to me, hey, you're going to wake up feeling this way three months in. Don't worry about it. Okay. Don't do this. Right. Do that. And it was like he's helping himself, but he's also helping guys like Matt Cantorino. And I did get the sense that he's pretty self-aware. He's a smart guy, Paddock. Cantorino is too, but Paddock is a smart guy. And I do think the idea that he's not just a bulldog, he's not just Mr. Sure. Durable. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think he knows his career is in the balance here. Right. This is a huge season for him to come back from a second Tommy John. He's yeah. got the contract extension, but certainly if he has a great year or two here, he could be in line for a real contract extension. And so they're yeah. counting on him to play a big role. He's essentially the replacement for Sonny Gray, which are just massive shoes to fill, obviously. Um, so yeah, that's what, that's one of the more interesting storylines. Obviously so far, so good. We're going to see him actually on the mound here in about three and a half hours. So we'll have more of a reaction to that on, on Monday's show. Um, Cantorino, who's probably going to start the season at triple A or double A maybe said, told me 125 innings is the goal. And that one I would expect to be more because it's happening in the minors, at least initially, I would expect that one to be more. Kind of three innings. Yeah. I mean, well, the Saints haven't been afraid to do that right. in general. More of a gradual a build guys, up. Right. Like, can we get you to kind of June and July with 70 innings, something like that, right. and then we can move forward? Because, I, I mean, he's 26, and before blowing out his elbow, he was putting up like video game type numbers right. in the yes. minors. The raw stuff, I watched him throw a bullpen, uh, you know, a foot away, watching him throw a bullpen and then talk to him about it afterward. The stuff is there. I mean, if you just right. talk to the catchers who caught him, I mean, he's mid-90s consistently with the fastball. 
got a very good breaking ball, a really good changeup that he can use against lefties. They're giving him another chance to kind of prove that he can be a starter because right. he can definitely be a he's, starter. He's from, got the three pitches. Right, that's right. the thing. Like a lot of guys get moved to the bullpen because they just they only have two pitches, or sometimes they only have one pitch. Right. Other guys get bull- moved to the bullpen because they, they can't, can't hold healthy, up right. and be a starter. They can't throw 175 innings or they can't make it through a lineup or whatever. And so from that sense, he's certainly been injured enough that I was like, maybe he just moves to the bullpen. But they, I don't, I get the sense they don't want to, and he doesn't want to toss aside what is very clearly a great three pitch mix, like a right. very traditional, this guy's a starter type of mix. On the other hand, and I asked him about this, but you know, you saw what Paddock did out of the bullpen in September. Right. You saw what Louis right. Varlin did out of the bullpen in September. So I wonder if the kind of ideal path for, for Cantorino, assuming he stays healthy, is make some of these two, three, four inning outings at double A, triple A to begin the season. Maybe build up a little bit to a four inning, five inning. You start to get to around 100 innings early in the second half right. of the season. And if you're as good as you were before the injuries, I wonder if they kind of view him as like, we can add him to the bullpen down the stretch, right? And then just unleash him for an inning at a maybe, time, maybe. And he could, and now we're a long way from that, but it was fun right. when they were able to do that with a couple of different guys. It was basically Brock Stewart, Chris Paddock, yeah. Louis Varlin. That took the bullpen from this is a pretty good group with pretty good stuff to man, everybody's throwing. Smoke well, he now. would certainly fall into. I mean, listen, they they probably want you know several of their double a triple a pitcher starting pitchers to sort of get to the point where they're almost at ready to go on the majors but if they get to the point in in july august september where they where they think okay well we need help in the bullpen now right they certainly don't seem to have any issue with trying that for well, and you know, it, a couple I, months especially and, also, and, and in fact even to the point where they again Instead of they do that, instead of actually making trade deadline moves, yes. Yeah. Right. But it also it it blends together with the idea of limiting his overall workload. Well, that's true too. Yeah, I mean, shifting right. a guy in August and September to the bullpen is a way to keep him from right. racking yeah. up thirty more innings or something like that. Before we get into some of the other uh, things we've learned, we including should. some bullpen situations <laughs> that I think are clarifying a little bit, that's right. we should talk about our sponsor here. Are, which are is, you missing your hatch which while is hatch. you're here in yeah. Fort Myers? So hatch is. Something to kind of help you get to sleep, stay asleep, and <laughs> right. also wake up in a way that is not like right. completely jarring to your entire right. senses. Yeah. Especially in Minnesota, where you know the time of sunrise can vary so crazy, and we're about to get into the point where it's you know we're approaching a five a.m. sunrise, <laughs> and in some of the uh, in, by by midsummer here. Uh, having something that can gradually get you out of your sleep sort of uh, reproduces the idea of a sunrise only in your room. So it's uh, it's called the Hatch Restore. That's the one they that I, they sent me, and it can kind of teach you how to when it's time to sleep or wake up with like cues, like sound cues or just timing cues for to kind of set a routine morning, after, like evening, so you can prioritize rest. Uh, there's also just like. There's an app, obviously, that you can use to kind of f- further design something that works for you. Right. Helps you wind down. And then in the morning, I actually like this better. Like, there's nothing worse than you just beep, did beep, some t- – yeah, right. That's the worst <laughs> sound ever. In fact, I just recorded a Fangraphs podcast where I had a fire alarm going off in the background. That might be the only thing worse. We, we had the housekeeping accidentally bumped our alarm clock or something. So yeah. we had to go up so this morning. So this – you can kind of – rise gently if you set it that way where a light comes on first so it's kind of like sunlight and then it gets you know you you might hear like forest sounds or something like right. that to kind of cue your body to start waking up gradually it's a really in- interesting idea and use of technology honestly yeah. and right now hatch is offering our listeners twenty dollars off uh the purchase of the hatch restore and you get free shipping if you go to hatch which is h a t c h hatch.co slash gleeman that's hatch.co not com yeah. hatch.co slash gleeman you get twenty dollars off and free shipping on the hatch restore uh that's hatch.co slash gleeman okay uh getting back to a few of these uh, other things we we're talking about the bullpen I, I sat behind home plate was it yesterday the day before i guess the day before 
and watched Jorge Alcala throw live BP to a bunch of major leaguers, yeah. teammates. Yeah. And I like to sit. You can, We can do a few things during live BP before the game start and everything. You can kind of sit adjacent to the uh, dugout, like in the camera well or on the side, and be kind of on the field for it. But you might want to keep your head on a swivel because you could get killed. <laughs> right, yeah. You can also go into the dugout, right. which gives you a different, a worse view, but also you can talk to some of the players as they're coming in sure. and get a sense of that. Or you can just sit behind, right behind home plate, which a lot of players choose to do. And the reason I like to do that for pitchers where I'm very curious what their stuff looks like like Pablo Lopez did live BP through live BP. Right. Well, I don't need to see Pablo. I mean, it's not like bad to watch him close. <laughs> sure. But like there's no question with Pablo Lopez. Right. Like yes. he, he's great. Right. But with Alcala, I was like, well, I want to know what the velocity is. And that, right. there's no velocity reading on the scoreboard here because right. there's nobody here. But if you sit behind home plate, they got the track man data that the coaches are all looking at. Right. And if uh, God is shining upon you, you know, Carlos Correa won't stand in front of it, and you can <laughs> right, sneak right. a peek at it. That's and right. I was able to do that. I was sitting by with Doe, and he was pretty consistently. I think he threw two innings, basically, of live BP uh, to two major league teammates. He was pretty consistently ninety six and ninety seven with the fastball, hmm. ninety to ninety two with the slider, which was a really good pitch for him pre injuries. Right. He topped out at ninety eight on a couple of different pitches that I saw on the track, man. Uh, and if you look, like he's always had really good stuff, but when the injury started the last couple of years for him, and he's really he only threw twice in 2022, and then about a dozen times last year before being shut down late in the, in the second half. But you know, he's one of those guys who's got such a power arm that he can throw 94, 95, and he's not even healthy. Right, but when he was really good, when he first came up in 2019, 2020, 2021, and he sort of started to gradually move up the bullpen chain to the point that he was like pitching some seventh innings, occasionally some eighth innings, depending on the matchups. And he was blowing people away a lot of the time. I mean, he had a, he had a yeah, three and a half right. ERA. He had yeah. more than a strikeout per inning. He was, you know, death on right handers. Like they had no shot. And then he started to show a little bit of an improvement with the changeup against lefties yes. and then got hurt. And yeah. it was all kind of he needed that it. third pitch to for right. the lefties. And so he, that's he, still working, he was working on that changeup. And we actually saw, like you said, some progress on that. You know, in 2020, was it 21? 21, at that time? the second half. Right. Um, and then he has been hurt for the past two years, essentially. Right. And so, but there is a difference when he's healthy. He's 97, he's 98. I mean, it, it's, it all gets right. lost in the shadow of Duran at this point. Duran owns, like, right. if you have a list of the top 100 fastest pitches in Twins history, it's just all Duran. <laughs> right, yeah. But, it's not that long ago before Duran's arrival <laughs> that like Bruce Dar Gratterall throwing a hundred was a big deal for right. the twins. Yeah. And at that same time, Al- Alcala throwing 98, 99 was a big deal for right. the twins. And so it seems like he's back to that stuff. Now, as you said, he's still gonna get the he t- was far from a polished, fully formed relief ace right. yeah. before the injuries. He was sort of ascending to that. I felt like, so now that he's healthy, it's like, okay, the stuff plays, like even some of the players, I won't right. say who, but like they were taking at bats and they were coming back and they were like, that, yeah, that's legit. Right. Um, and these were good hitters. Uh, if he's 97, 98 and the slider is what it was, then it's just a question of can he get the third pitch? Can he get that change up average, decent, yeah, right. that you can at least not be – completely overmatched or, you know, just be a home run waiting to happen right. when you're Versus facing left-handed, left-handed right. sluggers. Right. Right. And, you know, even if you can't, if you're just great against righties, there's a spot for you in sure. the majors. Yeah, sure. Because, I mean, he just shot – I think they hit 190 off him or something like that because it's just upper 90s fastball, 92-mile-an-hour slider, good luck. Right, yeah. But if he can get to the point where he's passable against lefties, where if it's just – he's just a not good matchup instead of yeah. a horrible matchup. Basically, he can give up hits – just don't yes. give up the home runs. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think that's possible. I mean, I think he showed real progress towards that two years ago. Um, but here's how you know the Twins bullpen is deep right now and good. <laughs> yeah, it was about, it was good. I, was I come from watching that, uh-huh. and I go back upstairs, and I look at my little spreadsheet that I have where I got, like, my projected roster and stuff, and I go, well, there's one spot yeah, that's it. to win, that's basically. Right. That's right. And, you know, realistically, maybe there's three spots that aren't fully locked in, accounted for. Mm-hmm. But two of those spots, in my mind, are probably going to be Jay Jackson 
as a righty and Stephen Okert as a lefty. Yeah. Because they spent money and, in Okert's case, traded away Nick Gordon to get those well, guys. And in both cases, those two don't have options. Correct. So there's, I, there's, there's like five locks in the bullpen. I think there's five locks in the bullpen, right? Duran, yes. Jax, Theobar, Stewart, Stewart, and Topa. Topa, yeah. Right? Which is a very good right. quintet. Yeah, quintet. Yeah, a great good quintet. Then you've got two more guys that you – you brought onto the team, and one is a free agent and one in a trade, who don't have options. Right. Can't right. be sent to the minors. Right. That's Jay Jackson and So Oker. they certainly have the at, the inside track, at least, for those last yes. two. They will, two of those I, I would say spots. if they have a healthy, reasonably effective camp, right. they're going to have those jobs. Well, right. that's seven spots then. Yeah. This is going to be an eight-man bullpen right? because you have five starters. It's going to be a 13-man pitching staff. Well, okay. The door is certainly open if – Alcala looks like he did in 2020 and 2021. He's certainly one of their best eight relievers. However, he has all of his minor league options remaining, right. despite the fact that he's 28 and arbitration eligible because he's been injured so often that they haven't been able to demote him to the minors, basically. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, you also have Josh Stallmont, yep. who's got a million-dollar deal, and he also has options, but he's more of a veteran, I would say. Right. Uh, and then beyond that, you have like the Thunderbirks of the world. You then have all the the long relievers if right. they want a multi-inning guy, yeah. that Cole Sands, Hedrick, Winder, etc. Right. Yeah. And so if all those guys are competing, not to mention like Zach Weiss, who they got <laughs> right. A, right. Right. off waivers and just some other NRI type of guys, sure. I mean, that last bullpen spot – some intrigue there, and it depends what they want for that role. If they want a multi inning guy versus a one inning guy, and so yeah, I'm sitting there watching this guy throw 98 with a wipeout slider, right. and I'm thinking back to how we used to talk about him in 2000, 2021, which is like this is a guy on the rise. This is right. a guy who's pretty good now and could be really good, and it's like, well, he might be with the Saints, and that's not necessarily right. a bad thing. Like right. it's not bad when a guy's had two years of injuries to say, go to AAA, get right, prove yourself again, and we'll work it. Because look, we talk about this all the time. The opening day roster itself, it's meaningless a day into the season. But what's like because they're just right. moved. Like we obsess about the twenty six that are going to go north, and then within an hour after the game start, it's like, oh, they made moves. Well, that's really true in the bullpen, right? I mean, that thing's going to be a revolving door to some extent especially because some of them don't have options. So that last spot is going to be somebody who does have options is going to go back and forth to triple A. But it's like, it speaks to their bullpen depth that you could have a guy who's been as good as Alcala for two years in the minor or in the majors, who has as good of stuff. I mean, it's just impossible to ignore how good his stuff is. And it's like, yeah, he might not even make the team. And it's not even a situation where I like would throw a fit over that. Right. And I like to throw fits, but like <laughs> you know, Stallmont, yeah, Stallmont. same thing. Yeah, Stallmont, like, is a, he has agent, upside also. Right? Yeah. And and so it was really good in the majors just a couple right. years ago, and he's coming back off of that surgery and feels like so. I really, care of. I really think the more I watch, because like the, the starters are on sort of a less daily routine for live batting practice. So we do get to see a lot of these relievers throw against major league hitters. Right. And now the games are starting. So we'll see them in games too. But like you start to go, man, that guy looks pretty good. Oh, he's their seventh reliever. That guy looks pretty good. Oh, right. he's their 12th reliever. Right. Like he won't even be. Right. And this is a very good deep bullpen. Um, and I think it, it could be a, a, a real strength in the sense that it can be good, but it can also be good in a way that they want it to be good, which is a lot of revolving door, a lot of, yeah, there's not that much drop off from the seventh guy to the twelfth guy. Right. So if somebody goes down, new guy comes in. Well, the interesting thing will be what happens if one of these guys isn't good. And one of these right. seven is True. not good. You know, like, okay, let's say Jackson just doesn't seem to have it anymore. He's right. out of options. I mean, I guess they can put him in as the eighth guy in the bullpen as opposed to sure. the sixth guy in the bullpen. But do they get to the point where you've got you – know, where we're sitting down there watching Stamont or Alcala tear it up in, in uh, St. Right. Paul and going, uh, you know, maybe it's time to make a change. What are you, you going to do with this veteran who's out of options? Or one of the five guys that you you know thought that you could absolutely depend on. Now, well, so some of those, some of them Some of them have options, I think. But, you know, those who don't. Yeah. Well, and there's going to be some injuries, obviously. Right. Those guys get hurt. Uh, so, yeah, that's something to watch, too. The the last spot or maybe two in the bullpen. Mm -hmm. And then we haven't even really talked about, like, the – we've been talking more about, like, the spots themselves. But then within that is, like, the higher The roles, yeah. Like, how, you know, we saw two years ago Griffin Jacks became the primary setup guy. Right. But then Griffin Jack struggled a little bit in the middle of last year, and Brock Stewart was so good yeah. that he was like basically on the verge, I thought, of 
just being on his own as the eighth inning guy. Yep. And then he got hurt. Right. And then when he got hurt, it was like, well, that reopened the door for Jax. It reopened the door for Theobar. It reopened the door. I mean, Topa filled the seventh and eighth inning role for the Mariners very well last year at times. So right. that's interesting, too. But I think that'll probably be a more of a topic for later in camp uh, that you can go on performance and you can kind of go how they're being used and all that stuff. Um, although the funny thing about spring training games is, like, the better you are, like, you're going to see Duran pitch, like, in the fifth inning. Yes, right. Yes. So that he can leave, right? Or That's go right. showered up right. and everything, because you, you the the more veteran the guys, even on reliever on relievers, the earlier they're going to play because that's when the fellow major leaguers are in the game. That's right. Uh, so it's a you little tricky. A, you want him facing major league players, not the guys from the you right. know double A team that are coming into the seventh inning. Right. And you don't want him sitting around for three hours just so he can pitch the ninth inning against right. the third string Pirates or whatever. Uh, let's see a couple other things that we think we've learned here. Um, Brooks Lee, we talked about this more on the Patreon. So again, I would, we would love to have you sign up for the Patreon and kind of join us as we ramp up for the season yeah. here, but we go a lot more in depth on a lot of this stuff, but, uh, Brooks Lee is going to start to move around more positionally, still primarily a shortstop, yeah. but going to play a lot of third base, going to play for the first time he told me since college, uh, second base. I think second base is ultimately where he's going to end up now, whether it's this season or future seasons, because Ed Julian's going to have something to say about that too. I didn't notice um, they were going through yesterday, the day before, just kind of standard infield work yeah. where a guy just takes repetitive ground balls. Right. And Edward Julian was taking him at second base. And I looked behind him and on the edge of the grass with his arms crossed, just sort of staring off was Rocco Baldelli <laughs> just very clearly s- stationed at second base <laughs> to see watching Julian there. take as many ground ball reps as he possibly can. Interesting. Because, I mean, look, I give Julian a lot of credit on how much he improved defensively last year. He went from, oh, my God, this guy is terrible at second base right. to weeks could go by where there were no plays that stood out in a bad way. Right. Yeah. Like still somewhat limited physically. The arm is a little bit weak. There's a few plays that happen where you're like, Ooh, yeah, he didn't charge that ball or he didn't make that play. Right. But game after game would go by where if you didn't know his background and you didn't know what he looked like a year ago at second right. base, you would have just thought, yeah, it's a decent second baseman. Yeah. The question now is, is there more improvement that can be had? Because if he can improve even another 10%, let's say, like, I honestly feel like he improved 50% last year. I know this is very subjective. But, like, <laughs> to me, he went from, like, a, a a D-level second baseman relative to major leaguers to, like, a C-plus level sure. or something like that, where it's, you're passing now. If he can get to, like, B-minus level even with that bat, then the defense is not an issue really at all. I right. mean, like, we yes. saw – I mean, we've seen much worse second baseman. Yeah, then the, then the Twins have a – you know, a good problem to have with Brooks right, Lee. With Brooks Lee. <laughs> right, yeah, and, right. you know, I think DH and first base, we are going to see Julian play there a little bit. That's fine with me. I mean, I, I've i started dreaming about around the horn of Lewis th- at third, Correa at short, Brooks Lee at second, and Ed Julian at first. I'll take a decade of that. Sure. I think you trot that out there for five years or more, and that is going to be one of the better offensive and defensive infields in the world. When I specifically asked Baldelli about his defense and how he felt about his infield defense yeah. this upcoming year. And uh, his answer was basically, well, we're going to be a lot better. Like he didn't make it sound necessarily like, Oh, we were not good last year, but he seems to be pretty excited about what he's got. And we haven't spent a lot of time this off season talking about the defense. You know, I, I remember when we would, you know, bring in a new shortstop, like uh, what was the Simmons? Andrew yeah, Simmons. Simmons. Yeah. Right. Andrelton Simmons. You know, we've spent a fair amount of time trying to try to dissect. Okay. What does our defense look like now? Is our defense going to be a lot better with Correa at shortstop? Is our defense going to be a lot better? Uh, you know, one of the things that we'll see now is we've got healthier bodies all the way around that right. that too. Like Royce Lewis is not coming back from well, uh, and knee surgery. Absolutely, Carlos Correa is not doesn't have plantar fasciitis right. anymore. Correa, I thought, was remarkably good at shortstop, considering what were very obvious limitations physically because right. of that injury. The fact that he was still right. a good shortstop and very very, yeah. very few bad plays there. But yes, if he's healthy, he can be a great shortstop. The thing about Lewis is, first of all, Lewis wasn't even playing this time last year, right? 
And the opening day shortstop was supposed to be Miranda. Right. And yeah. it ended right. up being third a lot base. of third, uh, base. yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. third baseman. It ended up being a lot of Castro and Farmer mm-hmm. and guys like that. And then Lewis joined the team. He was making the transition to third base for the most part last year. Right. And I thought he showed a lot of improvement too. I mean, he wasn't bad to begin with there. Right. Yeah. But by the playoffs, which he had he was sort of playing banged up even, obviously. He looked a lot smoother at third base. And so I would expect him, if he can stay healthy, obviously, to a year from now, we would probably, well, I, I expect him to be a very good third baseman. Yeah. I, we know Carlos Correa, is, if, if healthy, is a gold glove caliber shortstop. We just talked about the fact that Julian and, has. And even, even last year hurt, he should yes. look pretty good. Right? And Julian has improved to the point that he could, I'm not going to ever say he's going to be a good second baseman, but he's certainly a passable second baseman. And now you got Carlos Santana at first base as and well. And Carlos Santana at first base. And I think he's going to be playing yeah, more than more and more. That's, there. Yep. that's the next thing we've learned okay. here. Okay. So I guess we yeah. can fold okay. it into that. But I actually think Brooks Lee has a chance to be a very good good second baseman if that's where he ends up and if julian ends up being a dh first baseman he can be a good first baseman too long term short term i am yeah like you said i am more and more convinced that the prime if everyone's healthy the primary first baseman to begin the season is going to be carlos santana um and i mean that two ways i mean that one in he's going to play almost every day or you know more than a platoon role right. let's say yes which he's a switch hitter so that uh but when and the second thing I mean is when he does play, it's going to be more often than not at first base rather than DH. So what does that mean? Well, that means against a right-handed pitcher, you would have the switch hitting, left-handed hitting, Santana at first base, and you would have the left-handed hitting Alex Kirloff, if right. healthy, at DH. Right. I think that works in two ways. One, Santana is just a better first baseman than Kirloff. I don't think Kirloff is a horrible first baseman, but he certainly hasn't looked as good as he was expected to be over there. And that might be partly because he's had wrist and shoulder injuries the whole time. But then beyond that, from a durability and workload and just, you know, wrist and shoulder and injured list, if they're both going to be in the lineup, even if they were equal defensively, or honestly, even if Kirloff was slightly better defensively at first base, it might be worth playing him at DH just for the wear and tear aspect. It's a it seems to me a no-brainer that if you are going to play Carlos Santana 5 days a week, which I think that's worth debating if that's smart, but if you are going to do that, it should be mostly at first base because Baldelli has sung his praises as a defender. I mean, the Twins watched him for a decade right, yes. with Cleveland. He's a really good defender. He's an aggressive defender. He's not tall, but he makes up for that. He has a pretty good arm because he was a former catcher. He's good charging balls. He's pretty good scooping balls. Now he's 38. So maybe there's been some right. decline there yeah. that isn't evident to us yet. But I, I'm more and more convinced, as currently constructed with this roster, that you know, let's say if they're facing a righty on opening day, mm-hmm. it'll be Santana at first base and Kirloff at, at DH. Yeah, and I'm fine cool. with that. I think the the more the thing that I would like to more debate is what is the best use of Santana in terms of how often he's playing. Right. When he is playing, I have no problem playing him at first base. Right. Yeah, I think so too. It'll be interesting also as well, like once they're facing a left-hander. Right. Uh, you know, I ex- fully expect Santana to be at first yes, base. That's the obvious. That's one. the role. But then the question becomes: Then what do you do at the DH? Right. And I wonder how much, how often we're going to see somebody like Ryan Jeffers there, or we're going to see, you know, Jeffers catching Vasquez. I think we might see Vasquez as the DH sometimes, which makes no sense except that he caught the day before, and you yeah. want one of the you want to keep Jeff. It's you know, or it, it would be it would be Vasquez's turn behind the plate. But you want Jeffers in the lineup, but then you maybe switch him, up, switch him around, something like that. Yeah, I, I can mean, we'll see that. To, and we'll have to see what happens when they, if they get a right-handed hitting outfielder. Right. But then, but that right-handed hitting outfielder probably isn't in the DH spot. That's probably somebody that's going to be, well, could be taking out a Walner or a Kepler. Except, here's another thing. If Byron Buxton is playing center field, right. where's Willie Castro? Yeah, Willie Castro can be a right he's a switch hitter, but he can fair. be a right handed yep. hitting You're left absolutely fielder right. yep. or right field or, yep. or left fielder. And yes. so that I mean, and for that matter, against a lefty, Buxton could be the DH right. yeah. to give him sort of a half day and all that. Right. Um so yeah, I mean I think that they've it, very intentionally, post Nelson Cruz, left the DH spot as a revolving door, both as a way to give half days from a health standpoint, right. but also to just mix and match and not have to worry about how do we fit these guys into the lineup? And, you know, Santana absolutely has to be there in the lineup against lefties. 
I mean, that's the number one thing you're bringing him in to do right. is to provide a, le- a right-handed bat against lefties. The question is, against righties as a left-handed bat, how much do you want to expose them to that? I suppose if they do get a right-handed hitting outfielder, add a right-handed hitting outfielder, or if Austin Martin ends up coming north right. with that team, right? Yeah. You could versus a left hand left handed hitter have a pitcher, a left handed pitcher have a completely right handed lineup, right? Because you could, yeah. Some you put uh, a Castro in for one of the corner outfielders, Martin say in the for the other corner outfielder, Buxton in center field, uh, swap out Julian with Farmer, right? And one and of then, the catchers, and, and one of the DH. catchers can just right. I think mo- yes, you could, and I think they're not against that. <laughs> right. More likely, I think is Kepler will continue to play. I think oh I think so too. Or once in a while. Like one of the lefty bats will just stay in. Kepler or sure. Walner. Um which actually I talked about Delia about that, which we mentioned earlier. Um let's see there was one other thing. Oop, there goes the music. I told you the music would stay. <laughs> That's why we closed the window. Uh let's see yeah. I had one other thing that I wanted to uh Kirilov Stama. Di Sclafani we've talked about although I want to see him in a game. I want to see him go I do too. two or three innings before we can really – I mean, he's looked fine in live BP or anything. Mm-hmm. But um, the one other – oh, and uh, Farmer, you mentioned the Farmer Julian platoon. Right. I'm writing about this for next week, just the idea of platooning in general. Nobody steal that, all you writers <laughs> okay, all right. out there. The 10,000 Twins Daily people who are listening, <laughs> you sons of – I'll track you down. Um, I asked Baldelli about this. It's that's basically the plan again, which is Julian's the starting second baseman. He's looking better defensively. We love him offensively, but when a lefty's on the mound, he's just not better than. Kyle. I mean, that's something Kyle Farber does really well. We'll see. And yeah. Kyle Farmer's a very <laughs> yeah, good yeah. second baseman right. defensively. Yes. Uh, so I yeah, would which is t- one of the things Baldelli talked about as well is that beyond the infield that he's got, he's also got Castro yes. and Farmer as the backups defensively. Right. Which so I would expect to see that too, and I think that works out reasonably well. It also gives regular days off for people and all that too. Uh, okay, let's finish. By necessity, this will be short, which is probably a good thing <laughs> because we ranted about this enough. Again, we did well last week's free show. We did a forty-minute rant on this thing, right. but on the Patreon, we specifically kind of went line by line. Through, through Joe Paulette's Joe interview with DeRush on CCL, which is very funny because DeRush is here. They're do, or the, not now. They might have left today, but they and did a week just, of shows. They're around today. That's okay. it. Yeah. They did a week of shows, uh, him and his producer, Dan, right? Yeah. yeah. Dan Cook. Uh, Dan Cook. Um, it was very funny to like talk to them in the aftermath. Right. And he's like, man, Twins fans are angry. Or Twins <laughs> fans are passionate, is what he said. And I'm like, yeah. Because, De- I mean, Darush is definitely a sports fan, but he's not sure. like, you know, he, I don't think he knows like the 24th guy on the roster. Um, but he's definitely a sports fan. And he comes to games and stuff. But I think he was he was uh, blown away, let's put it, by the killing of the messenger that took place uh, for his interview well, a little bit. Uh, just on Twitter, basically. Okay. And this is a guy, by the way, who does like segments on his show about the state flag changing. So he's <laughs> right. used to getting yelled at on Twitter. <laughs> right. Yes. Uh, and even he was like, boy, that was something. Um, so the the big picture takeaways, we're not going to go line by line through it again because we did it on the Patreon. But, uh, you know, he, Polad, Joe Polad, essentially said, there, if there's spending to be had, it's going to be on the low wattage range, which we've talked about, the kind of right. 5 to $8 million range. We're not pursuing any of these $30 million players. That was one of his quotes, which is, you know, Montgomery, yeah. Snell, Chapman, Bellinger. We're going uh, to live where we're at. Right, this basically. Was, yeah. and That's one of his quotes. He said it was disappointing that the t- television situation worked out the way it did, particularly after they had sort of promised or, or I don't know, built people's hopes up on the blackout front and the streaming front and all that. Um, I appreciate – look, we don't want to discourage team officials, whether it's Polat or Dave St. Peter or Derek Falvey or Rocco Baldelli or whatever, from speaking publicly and answering questions in a truthful right. or – And to his, to his credit, he was very candid. Right. He was very straightforward on his answers. And right. so I, I really hesitate a lot of the times to be critical of that in the sense of you don't want to – like. You want people to answer questions. And because you don't like their answer or because their answer is frustrating to people, right? you don't want them to go, well, I'm never answering those questions again, <laughs> right? right? Sure. And so that's, I think, at play here with the pull-up thing is like, you know, if you listen to some of the interview, could he have handled it better? Maybe did some of the answers or the, the way in which he answered them, <laughs> like, 
you know, DeRush asked him, like, is there you're going to be pursuing some of the big name for agents who are unsigned? And you could almost see the gears turning in his head where he started to give kind of the pat answer of, oh. well, we never rule out anything. And I think what happened, I didn't, he left. We didn't get a chance to ask him, but we requested to talk to him, but he was already flying back to Minnesota. Um, I think what happened was he got like halfway through the pat answer of, well, we never rule out anything and we're going to be creative when he realized, no, this is just going to fan the flames. Yeah, let's just rip off the band-aid. Right. People (laughs) are going to go, oh, Pola didn't rule out Jordan Montgomery. And so then he just literally paused halfway through that sentence, kind of took a deep breath and went, no, 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 we're not. We are not. Um, And I, is this a surprise to anybody who's listened to this podcast over the last several weeks? No. It's not, but that doesn't make it any less jarring right. to a you know. A if lot you had of any hope before, you don't have any hope right. now. It's, right. it's been extinguished. It's the uh, it's like when Jeff Probst puts out the the torch on no Survivor. matter what, no matter how <laughs> depressed that market seems to be for right. Blake Snell and Jordan Montgomery and Cody Bellinger, like all of those guys that were like, just how low could this go? Yeah, could right. we actually be in play? The answer is no. Yes, <laughs> right. um, and that's not. Because Falvey doesn't want to do it, right? Yeah, and I think it's right. worth. I, and that is, I, I am glad that Polad himself did the interview, as opposed to Falvey having to speak for ownership, right? Because I think it is worth separating. One thing we've learned about Derek Falvey, whether the move themselves have worked out or not worked out, if you tell him he has a dollar amount available, he will spend that dollar amount. Like he will push the envelope. For whatever he's being given as a limit, he will make aggressive moves within that. He will make aggressive trades to try to add to that. And so it's not him He'll saying – He'll occasionally take in six-year deals. Right. Yeah, right, yeah, if and the right so comes along. it's not him going, please cut our payroll to $125 million. Right. He's doing – and I actually think given the limits, he's had a pretty decent offseason kind of filling in some of the margins and everything. But here was really the – you know, what is the takeaway from the Joe Polad interview? The takeaway is no big moves are coming, but we knew that. What is the takeaway that maybe changed our perception of something? To me, the comment was we're trying to right-size the business. Mm -hmm. And what I took that to mean is regardless of the television situation, (laughs) that yes, that was at the forefront and that got linked to the decline in payroll because – they feared they were going to lose like $50 million in television revenue for this season. And so the payroll's down $30 million, and you can kind of do the math on that. It's at least an explanation, if not the explanation. Except now they're getting a large chunk of that television money. Right. I am speculating it's in the $40 million range or maybe even a little bit higher, but they've intentionally kept that private, which I think in itself is interesting yes, um, or revealing. But beyond that – when he and the fact that they're getting let's say 40 or 45 million of what they had expected to be zero or 20 million even and then the payroll is still not going up right. well that tells you either they're taking this as an opportunity to just sort of leave this out there and slash payroll and kind of use this as an evergreen as excuse yeah. which i'm not putting that past any billionaires or ownership group but what I think even more worrisome is that there the real explanation is we're in trouble here from a monetary standpoint beyond the television. Like that obviously didn't help. Right. That's the messiest part of this. But when he starts to talk about right sizing the business, right. they're effectively saying we're losing too much money on this baseball team and have been basically since COVID twenty twenty. And I do believe they they're losing money and I do believe you know, they thought 2020 was going to make them huge revenues. You were coming off a great 2019, sure. and instead they had no fans. I mean, they lost a lot of money on that season. And then the team was bad in 2021 and bad in 2022. And they lost a lot of money on those seasons probably too because they were trotting out decent-sized payrolls. And even last year, you know, you had a $158 million payroll. It was a little shade under $2 million, uh attendance, which is good but not great. You made some playoff money and all that, but – then you toss in, okay, you go into the offseason where you're worrying about losing $55 million. My worry, based on some of these comments and based on just their lack of, of payroll right now, is this might be where we're at for a while here yeah, on spending. Well, and uh, if you check out my story on Twins Daily, we talked a little, I talked a little bit about you know if, they, if this is the new level that they're playing at, right? If they're 
if they're really going to limit themselves to about $125, $130 million payroll this year, and even if they they go up from that again, like they go back to the, hey, let's go up another 10% for next year, right? right? Well, that gets them to about 140. And at right now, just hanging on to the core guys with all the arbitration awards, a lot of these guys are going to start getting expensive. Well, right. Like Pablo yeah. Lopez goes next year from making eight and a half million to making 21 million, for instance. Yeah. And then we've got, uh, you know, Joe uh, Ryan and Bailey. Joe Ober, Ryan and Bailey. Lewis Ober, Lewis. Ryan Jeffers. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, right, Rich Lewis. Get, a bunch of these guys are going to get, get, get three, four million dollar arbitration awards. Right. And if you just the sort of the core. If you're just trying to keep together the core, if everything goes as well as it possibly can, you're yeah. sitting at about one hundred and thirty nine million dollars in payroll next year, which is means we could be ending up. Starting the off season with, well, we've got got what we've got, right? Or, or we need to we, shed. Or we need to start shedding right. somebody. And there are some opportunities to do that. I mean, Vasquez will have a ten million dollars salary for next season. Yeah, there's some other opportunities to do that. Sure, but and so I've talked about this. I've looked up the actual numbers. We've mentioned this a couple times on shows, but I tweeted it out. So I'll tell you guys now. You know, they're a sen- they're effectively right now back to Metrodome level spending. Right. And wh- I don't mean the raw number. I mean their last years at the Metro, they were spending under a hundred million on payroll. But relative, you know, whether you want to go by inflation or uh, my preferred method is compare a team's payroll to either the average or the median MLB payroll. Right. I think that is the most telling. You know, it also works if you want to use inflation and stuff. Sure. But basically, how do the tw- how are the Twins relative to the other twenty nine teams? That's all I'm interested right. in. Yeah. I mean, look if. The Twins could spend $50 on the payroll. If the other teams were spending $55, I'd be sure. fine. Right. But the average payroll right now across MLB is, I think, $164 million. And that's going to rise because there are still right. probably about at least $500 million of free agents left to sign. Um, the median, I think, was high 150s. And like we've said, the Twins are at 124. Maybe they'll get as high as 130 or something like that. Right. So comparing their spending – to either the average, let's go with average, but you can also do median. It still applies. Uh, I double checked that because it, it, here's how it's Twitter works. Same. Yeah, here's right. how Twitter works. As soon as you say I'm comparing this to average, the first twenty replies are, "What if you did median instead?" <laughs> it's like, yeah, thanks. Man. I think when you said it on the podcast the other day, I said the exact same thing. Yeah, well, you're t- <laughs> what is it? <laughs> you're Twitter. Did you use mean or median? <laughs> you're Twitter. You're a tweeter. Uh, it works. I get it. I get it. It's, uh, mathematics semantics. Sure, I'm, sure, that's, sure. I'm big into that okay, too. Don't yeah. worry. So here are the numbers. That's why I looked them up. For officially, so their current payroll is seventy five percent of the MLB average, okay, and eighty three percent of the MLB median, okay. Um, the last time it was that low on either of those seventy five percent of average, eighty three percent of median was two thousand nine, okay, which happens to be the last yeah, year yeah. pre Target Field, so the right. last year yeah. at the Metro game one sixty three. Yes, <laughs> yeah. their spending that year was seventy four percent of average. So basically identical. It's seventy four percent versus seventy five percent, and eighty point five percent of median. Now it's eighty three percent. So that's to me that's jarring. Now that'll right. change if they sign Adam Duvall or something for six million, sure. but it won't change that much. And so to be in year what are we year fifteen of Target Field, fourteen yeah. of Target Field, which opened in twenty ten, uh, and to effectively be back to pre Target Field spending levels relative to MLB as a whole. I don't know how you could take that as anything but disheartening or discouraging or dis something and fill in the blank right. there. Like I don't know there's any way that even the twins could realistically attempt to spin that. They might have a reason for it and they might tell you sure. it's going to change in the future, but think back to even two or three years ago, or honestly even this time last year. If I would have said to you a year from now, they're going to be spending the same amount relative to MLB average that they did in 2009 at the Metrodome. Right. You'd have been like, well, why, what? Why? Why, why would why, that be the yep. case? And that's what I think is just going to be hard to get around. Can this team win like that? Absolutely. Especially as they're sort of entering their competitive window. Right. They've actually won some anything, games. The regular season it has a little bit more interest now because we can actually right. see it as a precursor to some success in the postseason. Yeah, that, I mean, that's the thing. Like, And again, I'm going to end this like very shortly, so this won't be another full scale ra- uh, rant. But there need like I feel like there's people are getting confused. There needs to be a differentiating between the two concepts that are at play here simultaneously. One is 
you can absolutely win with a hundred twenty five million dollar payroll right. in twenty twenty four in the American League Central. Hell yeah, you can win. Right. In fact, I think they will win. But yes, that can be true. And what can also be true is they'd have a better team if they spent a little money. <laughs> yeah, they'd yeah, have a yeah. better chance of winning, right. not just in the AL Central, but in the playoffs right. and beyond. And they might be the favorites in the AL Central, but the favorites in the AL Central might be 65%. Right. Well, if they spent another $35 million, maybe they'd be at 80% or 90% or, you know, let alone what happens in the playoffs. And so I do think it's weird that, like, so many – people when they hear the payroll discussion and i get it there are people who are just they, they're the type of fans they want to be supportive they want to they don't want to deal with this sh- crap right that's fine like it's not fun to talk about this stuff I, honestly if we if you and i yes. just wanted to maximize our personal profits from this podcast <laughs> right. we would never talk about payroll because right. what happens when we talk about payroll people get discouraged about the team and then they stop listening to so but there needs to be a way to differentiate the concept of they can win with less money, but more money would help. Those are not mutually exclusive things. Right. And I think that's part of the challenge here. And then the only other thing – here's one other thing I was wondering, then we will stop because people keep opening the door now. That's our sign <laughs> to stop when people need this room. Um, I wonder – if they had any sense that this would be occurring, which they didn't, obviously, two or three years ago, would they have not signed Correa? Yeah. The well, second time? I, 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 uh, one of the reasons I was thinking I would mind talking to Falvey, we haven't really talked to Falvey since yeah. these things, is that was one of the things I – I don't know exactly how he would answer that, but I think it's an open question. Like, when you were making various moves, when you were setting things up so that this offseason you were going to have $40 million to spend on payroll, would you have made all the same moves you made if you knew that there was going to right. be a $30 million cut coming? And I think the answer is probably, I have no idea. You know, <laughs> you know, you know, yeah, he, he's going to say, I don't really know what I would have done sure. differently, to be honest. You, know, you, you can but, only act with what's in front of you and what you expect right. to be in front of you. This is obviously a curveball for but, them. But now you've got, you know, $33 million tied up in Korea for the next three years. You've got, or 36 probably, probably next yeah. year. Uh, you've got, um, you know, fifteen million dollars in bucks. You get twenty-one million dollars between those three guys. Now you're talking fifty-seven, sixty-two, seventy-two million dollars out of a hundred and thirty million dollar payroll. It's like that's sixty percent or more than, right. of your overall payroll. I, and also, just that's like a more of a theoretical, like what would you do? And yeah, Falvey's not going to say like, and I wouldn't have done it. But right, it does. Like we can do the math for him and. Yes, the contract itself is just raw dollars, so it's thirty something million dollars a year for six years. But thirty million dollars a year, let's say, has a much different domino effect, or is much more limiting if you have a hundred million dollar payroll versus you have a three hundred million dollar payroll. Like Carlos Correa, and this is I, I'm I'm it makes me physically ill that we're having this conversation again because <laughs> right. this is the conversation we used to have in the Metrodome days. Right. Yeah. It, I'm, I'm I'm really it's it's horrible to be having this conversation because back then it'd be like, well, this guy's got a pretty reasonable salary and he's certainly worth more than his salary, right. but is he worth more than a salary to a team that isn't spending money? Right. And it's like, well, Carlos Correa as a thirty million dollar player is fine. Right. But it's more limiting if the payroll is 125 million and he's taking up a quarter of the payroll right. versus if it's 165 million and he's taking up, you know, a fifth of the payroll or right. whatever. And so that's I mean that's tricky. It sucks because that's not how it should be. No. It shouldn't be like, oh, we spent this money on this this guy and now the entire thing has shifted and we can't get out of it. Well, you right. shouldn't want to get out of it. You right. should be yeah, happy right. with yeah, Carlos right. Correa, right. but now they're in a situation like that. And then the last thing is I don't know if you saw this last night the Arizona Diamondbacks, who are one of three teams that are fully uh, gone from the Bally Sports umbrella or okay. the Diamond Sports umbrella and under the MLB distribution umbrella for their streaming and TV rights, it's the Diamondbacks, the Rockies, and the Padres for this year. Okay. And might have been the Twins if right. Amazon hadn't swooped back in. Right. So they released a tweet and a link to a page. Here's our TV setup and our streaming setup. Right. $99 for the whole season. Okay. You get access to all the games, and if you're in the Arizona area, it's blackout free. There are okay. no blackout restrictions. Okay. Now, the problem is going to be like when they're playing the Marlins, and you live in Miami, or you live something like that, the game still is going to apply to the blackouts sure. of MLB yeah, as a whole. Yeah, that's true. 
Yeah. So that's something they can't really get yeah. around. But right. not, here's what's interesting. And I saw I tweeted it out, and I saw predictably a bunch of Twins fans in my replies saying, "Oh, I'd gladly play 99 bucks a seat." Well, yeah, that's that's a good deal. Right. Because now you're not paying directly, but you're paying hundreds right. of dollars a month right. for DirecTV or cable just to have them. But here's the problem, and why the math falls apart, and why the situation is such a mess. Big picture, not just for this season. Well, let's say the Twins need to make up for forty million in revenue. Right now, they can sell ads if they're the ones distributing the product. Yeah, but that's not going to bring in this massive amount of revenue. Right. There's also going to be an ad split some there. Somebody's right. selling those ads. Somebody right. is, and the overlooked thing I feel like is if they take over their own broadcast, somebody is then paying all the on-air talent. Somebody is paying all the cameramen and production people. Somebody is paying all the travel costs sure. that right now Diamond Sports is paying them. Right, yeah. And so that's going to cancel out any ad revenue. But let's just say, how are we going to make up for $40 million in revenue that we would have gotten from a traditional TV setup that we now need to make direct-to-consumer? Right. Well, at 100 bucks a pop, that's a great price point, for I think, for a consumer. I would gladly – that's sure. less than a buck a game. Like, right. yes, do it. We charge a buck an episode. They're charging <laughs> less <laughs> than that. How do you get from a hundred dollars to four forty million? million? Well, it's four hundred thousand yeah. subscribers, right. and I don't know if people realize the scale of that. But I would be if you said put an over under on how many people would sign up if the Twins offered a similar product to the ones that the Diamondbacks are at a ninety nine dollar price point, which I think is a very reasonable price point. I would certainly bet on closer to forty thousand. Yeah, I would say than four hundred. That's exactly what I was going to say. They're off by almost a, a zero. Right. <laughs> right. And so yeah. you can do all by the a math. Factor of ten. Right. Exactly. You can do all the math you want, and all the talk about other forms of you know advertising, or they could do this and they could do that. But there are other costs involved too that they're not currently having to shoulder. Right. There's no way to make up a tenfold difference. Right. Basically. So are they on TV at all then, or are they just yes, only? It's going to be a situation where they've got a channel on. You know, direct TV or whatever. I mean, that makes it even harder. Right. Right. I mean, I, 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 that's I, my you, understanding. I, mean, I right. might be wrong. I mean, if you are, uh, if well, you, they're going to get some money yeah. from direct TV and um, cable. Okay. Now it's right. not going to be a lot, but yeah. it's it's not getting people to pay you a hundred dollars a year to watch a baseball team is very doable, but the scale of it is so far out of whack because. The system that was in place with DirecTV and cable, they weren't just charging baseball fans to have the channel. They were charging everyone with a cable subscription right. to have the channel. So people were paying $4 or $6 out of their monthly cable bill for the Twins channel, even if they never watched the Twins. Right. And so now you've only made it so that you can only sell to people who are very hardcore baseball fans right. and there's a lot of those thankfully we're thankful that there's thousands upon thousands of them right. but there ain't 400,000 of them right there is nowhere near 400,000 of them to the point that that's almost like a laughable number like they, there's no they could they could win five world series in a row and they wouldn't get 400,000 people to pay $100 a year to pay. Right. That's just not a possibility in a state that has X number of people. Right. Um, and so I don't know how you get around that necessarily, which makes this whole situation full of not good choices. Right. You know? Yes. Um, so that's where the Diamondbacks are at. Um, all right. That's it. Uh, we'll be back Sunday night or Monday morning, one of those two things, to – Yes, to probably for a mailbag. Yes. Yeah, that, that will be Patreon only, obviously. So. Yes, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, uh, patreon.com slash Gleeman. We're thing. a month from opening day. It would be a great time to sign up for the Patreon, uh, ride with us through spring training up until all the roster mm -hmm. decisions are made, and then we'll just start doing our thing. Uh, during the season. Yep. Thank you to Hatch for uh, making this podcast free. With uh, Go to check out hatch.co slash Gleeman. To, Thank uh, you to the board game industry <laughs> for sending freebies to Matt Cantorino and company. Right. Thank you to USA Today Crosswords for being easier than New York Times Crosswords. <laughs> Thank you to the Gophers for coming down to Florida to play a game and kick Gophers. off the baseball season tonight. And uh, we'll talk to you later. Gleeman. <laughs>